And now for our keynote program, we have somebody from Portland, Oregon, Patrick Galvin. He's the owner and president of the Galvanizing Group. And we're going to visit him via Zoom. So if you don't mind, we're going to call him up right now and we'll meet Patrick Galvin. Well, Patrick Galvin, thanks for coming to join us at the Video uh, Rotary Club of Tucson. This is actually our first Zoom meeting within our virtual meeting. So uh, we are, we're trailblazers, just like they were in the old Oregon days. <laughs> the Oregon Trail, uh, the video version. I love exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, we appreciate We're looking forward to watching the TED Talk. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to give you an opportunity. Give us a little bit about your background and, you know, where you come from and all that type of thing. Well, I'm in Portland, Oregon. I am a member of the Rotary Club of Portland, Rotary Club number 15 in the world. We were founded in 1910. Uh, our club is similar to yours, uh, I think, size-wise. We're about 225 uh, members. We've got anywhere between about 120 and 140 members who go to our real-world meetings, averaging a little bit less than that for our virtual ones. So. Uh, Big Rotarian, been a member of my club for seven years. I'm the president of our charitable trust. I was a Rotary exchange student in Brazil uh, a oh, really? long time ago. Yes, yes. Oh, that's great. That's what got me interested in becoming a Rotarian and uh, it took me 25 years to join, but I absolutely love it. I joined Rotary for service and it's been fantastic also for my business. I've made a lot of great uh, connections that have really helped my business. And my focus in my business world is I'm a business coach and I go out and I speak around the world on how people can build better businesses through creating stronger relationships. Oh, that's really, that's, that's fantastic. So I imagine uh, relationship building is something that you can apply very easily to your rotary world. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, a lot of the best practices I've learned have come from Rotarians, uh, people who are really good at building relationships. So absolutely, Rotary is a wonderful place to practice relationship building as well as to uh, learn from some great mentors. So one of the things we do at Rotary, when we invite people to come in, you know, obviously we want to hear all about you and what you do. Um, we try not to allow you to sell or, or, or ask for money, but, you know, I have actually read your book and it is a great book. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity for, you know, taking the time to visit with us. Tell us a little bit about the book because I really enjoyed it. The book is a business parable. So it, it contains all the lessons I think are absolutely essential for anyone to grow a relationship-centric business. Uh, it's a fast read, about 90 minutes if you read it. Uh, you can actually listen to it. It's on Audible. It's also Kindle. So you can get all those different formats on Amazon. Uh, there's a chapter in there about Rotary, inspired by a real-world experience in Rotary. Uh, so the objective of the book is to help people think about business perhaps a little bit differently, maybe in the case of many to go back to the old way of doing things, what's old is new again. And really in the age that we're in right now, uh, a very complicated time for all business people, building relationships is gonna be what sees people through. Not only it's gonna help them survive, but it's gonna allow them to thrive in this new world in which it's really important to be connected with people, uh, well, speaking, your customers or prospects, yeah. Speaking of connections, you know, people that know me well in the Rotary Club, I'm a a firm believer in writing handheld notes. And you reference that in a big way in the book. Uh, I cannot tell you how important it is that, you know, getting away from email and text messaging and, and sending something handwritten in the mail is so powerful. Just reference that for a second. Oh, absolutely. I got a handwritten note from our club president this year, wishing me a happy birthday. Mm -hmm. I got three handwritten notes this year. We have 225 members. She took the time to write to me. It makes me feel very important. I belong to other clubs and groups. I feel much more aligned with my president because she took that extra effort. And it was three sentences, but it was personal to me and to the relationship that I have with her. Well, so, uh, go yeah. ahead. Those things matter. Those things matter. Well, the, one, the way I describe it to people is when you, when you go to your mailbox and you pull out all your junk mail and there's something that's handwritten, what's the first thing you're going to open? You're going to open the handwritten note. So... Um, I really appreciated that part of the book, and I'm going to really recommend to our, our club that, you, that they purchase a Connector's Way, because I thought it's a, a great way to live one's life. So what, why don't we move into your, your TED Talk? Um, we're going to show that next, but uh, give us a little bit of background uh, uh, where that was and, and, and what the message is that you're delivering. Well, I delivered that TED Talk just a few months ago in Oregon. And one of the main points of inspiration was my experience as membership director of my club for a couple of years. Um, I thought all I needed to do was to share the good word about what Rotary does and all these people would flock to join us. 
Uh, didn't work out the way I had thought. Uh, I struggled as membership director. So I've been thinking ever since then, it was about five years ago that I had that experience. What did I do wrong? How could I position Rotary differently to be more attractive to people? And I started delving into all the research around um, how serving others is good for oneself, both mentally and physically. And that's what I focused on in my TED Talk because um, I don't think we do a very good job um, as Rotary Club selling the benefits to the member of being right. a Rotarian. Right. Well, I'll tell you what, let's go to the TED Talk. Now, I've asked a few Rotarians to call into our Zoom. Are you able to stick around and answer some questions afterwards? I would love to. Okay, so that's great. So, ladies and gentlemen, fellow Rotarians, uh, direct your attention to the screen. We are going to go, I guess, tape delayed to McMinnville, Oregon for Patrick Galvin and his TEDx talk. Thanks. We'll be back in a little bit. Would you be interested in a medicine that reduces stress, increases happiness, and makes you live longer? What if I told you that medicine is free and that there are no negative side effects? The medicine I'm talking about is not packaged as a pill, powder, or potion. Rather, it's delivered to your body and mind through your service. To others. When I was fresh out of college, I landed my dream job with the city of Los Angeles as a management trainee. I had visions of rising through the ranks of government, working alongside other enthusiastic young people in an exciting department like water and power. <laughs> Instead, I was offered a position with the Department of Aging that delivered meals on wheels, job training, and other essential services for the city's low-income seniors. I'm not proud to admit that I almost turned that job down when I learned that most of my colleagues would be in their 70s. But I accepted it because I had rent and student loans to pay. <laughs> On my very first day at work, I met Thelma. She was about five feet tall in her mid-70s, and she looked fabulous in her sparkling silver stilettos that she wore every day. She was the most put-together woman I had ever met, and she was so dedicated to her work. She would often stay late to make sure that her fellow seniors got the services that they needed. Her dedication kept her physically strong and mentally sharp. She had more zest for life than anybody I had ever met, and she was so different from many of our clients who spent their days dwelling on the past or in the inevitable aches and pains that can come with aging. More than 25 years have gone by since I worked with Thelma. Experience and education have reinforced the valuable lesson that she taught me, one that can best be summed up in the words of Martin Luther King, who said, everybody can be great, because everybody can serve. For the past seven years, I've been a member of the Rotary Club of Portland, Oregon. And like all local Rotary Club members, I also belong to Rotary International, which is one of the oldest and largest service organizations in the world. Now, as the president of my club's charitable trust, I love tracking the financial generosity of my fellow members who contribute so much to a wide variety of worthwhile causes. But what impresses me even more is their commitment to service. Every year, members of my club volunteer in a wide array of service projects, in areas that include domestic violence prevention, homeless solutions, community grants, international service, peace building, environmental protection, and polio eradication. Members of Rotary who embrace service are some of the most joyful and optimistic people I know. However, I am really worried that someday my club will have to cut back on its service work because we won't have enough volunteers and enough members. This problem is not unique to my club. Over the past two decades, Rotary has seen a 25% decrease in its membership across the United States. A lot of other great service organizations are also struggling. The Shriners, Masons, Elks, Lions, and many nonprofits have seen 
significant declines in both members and volunteers over the past few decades. Why is it that so many wonderful service organizations and great nonprofits are failing to recruit and retain members? Well, one of the biggest reasons I feel is that they continue to appeal to people's altruism while ignoring the motivating power of self-interest. I know this from personal experience. When I served as membership chair of my Rotary Club, I felt all I needed to do was to go out in the world and share the good news, tell people about our great service work, and people would flock to join us. I failed. As membership chair, I saw membership decline. <laughs> If service organizations and nonprofits want to not only survive but thrive, they must move away from altruism and appeal directly to people's self-interest, even if that approach seems crass. It used to be that altruistic appeals were enough. Back in the day when a lot of people worked 40-hour work weeks and had long lunch hours and weekends free, they had time to join a service organization or volunteer for a nonprofit. And in good chunks of our country, community service was seen as something that good citizens just did. Now, <laughs> finding members and volunteers is a lot more challenging. Stagnating middle-class wages mean that a lot of people are working longer hours simply to get by. And many of us have a hard time leaving work at the workplace because our jobs now follow us 24/7 through text messages and emails. So, how do we break through? How do we attract people in? Well, I think we need to lean in to self-interest and move away from this notion of altruism. And this may sound rather self-serving to many of you. But here's the thing: if we have service organizations and nonprofits aren't growing, we could be very proud of ourselves, but we're going to die. And we need to give ourselves permission to better ourselves through service, so we can sustain our commitment to serving others. We now live in this age in which we are just deluged with information. We say we don't have time, but what if we just turned off our devices? Our smartphones, our computers, and televisions for just a little bit of time, and instead of spending it there, we devoted it to service. Think of the benefits that we would get out of that. What are they? What benefits might we see from service? Well, I'm going to go through just some. I don't have time for all of them, but if you're looking to live a healthier life, service can provide that. There's a lot of research that has come out that has shown strong correlations between. Those who serve, and those who enjoy good health. One recent study found that people who volunteer 200 hours a year were 40 percent less likely to suffer from hypertension than non-volunteers. This is due to their being social, active, and yes, altruistic. If you seek a longer life, consider service. Consider service. Forty international studies found up to a 22 percent reduction in mortality rates for those who serve, and it's not going to take as much time as you might think. One study found that people who volunteer just 25 hours a year for a cause or organization that's important to them see a significant increase in their life expectancy. The emotional Benefits of service are also worth emphasizing. If you want tranquility, service actually kicks off a process that makes this happen. When you serve others, your body produces oxytocin, which is a hormone that buffers stress and puts you into a more relaxed state. If you're wanting more friendships, consider service. A recent study found that 25 percent of all Americans say they don't have a single friend. Or family member to confide in when they have a problem. This social isolation is incredibly alarming, and it also presents a major public health challenge. 
Lack of friendships has been found to be a more significant indicator of early death than obesity, smoking, or high blood pressure. And when we serve others, we're associated with people who share similar values to ours. Can you imagine a better group of people to become potential friends? And when you serve others, what I've found is that oftentimes the people you're serving go on to become your friends as well. If you're craving happiness, service provides a way. When you serve, your brain is producing dopamine, which is this mood-elevating neurotransmitter. If you're runners, you've heard of this. You call it the runner's high. You get it from doing marathons and all these extreme events. Here's the good news. You don't have to run anywhere. <laughs> you do not have to run anywhere. You can stand in place, or if you want to sit down, helping a single person, and you're going to get a huge dopamine rush. On top of that, when you serve others, you're giving your life a sense of purpose and mission that, for many folks, translates directly into higher levels of happiness. Yes, I can make a very compelling argument for service on scientific grounds. But for many of us, a much more convincing way to appreciate service is to look at the people we admire and see what they get out of it. My 86-year-old father and 81-year-old mother moved into an adult living community a couple of years ago. When they made a transition from a home they had lived in for 40 years to a small apartment, I worried about how well they would adapt. My worries were unfounded. Now, when I try to call my parents on the phone, they're never home. <laughs> they're out serving people. They volunteer in the community garden, they volunteer in the convenience store for residents, they volunteer in the local elementary school, they volunteer on the welcoming and leadership committees, they write articles for the community newspaper, they are doing so much stuff. My brothers and I are convinced that our parents look and act much younger than most people their ages because of their service work. They're so busy volunteering that they don't have time to dwell on the passing of friends and relatives or the many other challenges that can face people as they age. I'm convinced that their service has provided them with a quality of life uplift that absolutely no medicine could possibly deliver. My hope is that someday a lot more people in the world will have this benefit of service that my parents enjoy. For this to happen, service organizations and nonprofits need to do a much better job sharing how volunteers benefit from service rather than relying on altruistic appeals that have lost their impact. But none of us should wait for this to happen. Instead, we should go out and talk to the people we admire who serve, and ask them how it makes them feel. There's an excellent chance we're going to hear variations of, I get so much more than I give. Then, let's ask them why. And listen very carefully to what they have to say. And let their why help motivate us to embrace the power of doing well for ourselves by doing good for others. Hey, Patrick, that was, uh, that was fantastic. What a great talk and uh, so appropriate for what we're doing in Rotary Service Above Self. And, you know, I give some talks on happiness, and one of the things that I talk about is how giving of yourself makes you feel better. And uh, I thought it was really a great talk. So thank you for, uh, for delivering the TED Talk for us. And like I told you beforehand, we have a bunch of Rotarians uh, that have been in the club for a long time, and they'd like to maybe uh, pound you with some questions for five or 10 minutes. If you can, if you can handle our people, can you handle us? <laughs> I think so. I'm, I, I have a couple of cup, cups of coffee in me. I'm, I'm good to go. Okay. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to, uh, first one, I'm going to, I'm just going to, this looks like, uh, what was the name of that show? You know, the, uh, with all the squares, Hollywood squares. All oh, right. Go to the left. I'm going to go to Curtis Dawson. 
Oh, you're going to have to unmute yourself. There you go. There you go, Curtis. Thank you, Patrick, for uh, doing this for us. And thinking about my time in Rotary, if I'm honest, I started in Rotary based out of self-interest, but I stayed in Rotary because of relationships. So I'm just wondering, how do we intentionally build on relationships in our Rotary Club? Well, I think it's a great question, Curtis. It's so important uh, to provide opportunities for members to build relationships, especially in larger clubs like ours. Um, so we are huge into really making sure members are engaged by being on committees because we feel like the committees is where they make close friendships and build relationships. We also try to create social things around our program. So if we're going out and we're doing a service project, we always want to do a happy hour or something fun afterwards with those people engaged uh, in that project. Uh, we're big believers in business exchanges. So we do these on a quarterly basis where we have members host these uh, events at their businesses and we split up into smaller groups. So always looking for that opportunity to break down our large size and get into smaller groups of people because then we just have more time to, to chat and interact with one another. Great. Um, hey, Jennifer, what about you? Thanks. Thank you so much, Patrick. I, I too really enjoyed your TED Talk, and I think that we have a lot to learn from it. But uh, you had mentioned that in your experience with Rotary, you're a membership chair. And I was wondering, after listening to your TED Talk, how you used your ideas as far as, you know, the emotional part of giving back, of the service part, how, how did you use that to recruit new members? And if you couldn't implement those ideas, how would you in recruiting new members? Well, I think all Rotarians should be membership chairs. I think we all have that chance to invite people. And personally, what I'm doing is I'm leaning into my TED Talk when I talk to people. So before I would sell people on the benefits of, hey, we do all this good in the world. Now when I talk to friends and clients who I'm trying to get to come to my club, I'm sharing with them how I am feeling better about myself, both physically and mentally, I'm sharing some of that data that I shared in the TED Talk and one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, I think anyone who's a membership chair it is a tough haul if you're doing it all on your own. I think all Rotarians should step up and be willing to share from a very personal standpoint how they've benefited from membership. And I think Rotary Clubs, if we're growing one by one by one, we can get really large very fast if individuals take it upon themselves to really spread the good word about how service makes them feel. So, Patrick, uh, the, the next question is from Bob Schaap. Bob is a past president, and actually he has a, a company called Customers for Life Consulting, and he's all about relationship building, which is what you're all about. So I'll turn it over to Bob. Hi, Patrick. Yes, we are birds of a feather. Uh, your, your emphasis on relationships is what it's all about. My question is about uh, – well, well, let me start. We have, we have a great club. Our club is fantastic with some great people in it. but a continuing problem is what I call churn. We, we lose just as many members as we gain. And I, I did a little data look up on our club runner and, and over the last 10 to 15 years, we've lost 350 people, lost. Yet we're bigger than we were back then by about 10 or 12. So we've gotten 360 people in and 350 people out and that list of 350 people is like a who's who in Tucson. What can we do about that and do a better job of keeping churn down? What experience do you have that can help us? Well, I, I feel your pain. Our numbers are not that different from yours, the Rotary Club of Portland. Uh, so what we have been finding is there's a difference between the Rhino, the Rotary and name only versus the active engaged Rotarian. So we are really cognizant of uh, member engagement right now. So we want our members to be on committees. We want our committee chairs to be more proactive in inviting people onto their committees. Because what we find is if people are engaged outside of the lunch, they're engaged in service work, they're much more apt to stay. So uh, we just weren't measuring that before. And since we've done that, it's been really uh, good. The other thing is Rotary started as a fellowship organization. And I think to marry up service and fellowship is a very important way to stay, keep people engaged. So you know, let's do our service projects, but let's tie in fun things related to those and give people a chance for conversation. Because I'm guessing your club's a lot like ours, you know, at a luncheon, you really don't have that much of a chance to interact. We find that if people are going to the social activities and serving on a committee, they stick with Rotary. If they're just showing up at Tuesday luncheons, uh, their membership is at risk. 
I think that's really accurate because uh, I'm as guilty as anybody. You know, we have so much, when we're meeting in person, we have so much stuff we have, rotary business that we do. And uh, it doesn't give you much opportunity, even at the, your same table, to have meaningful conversations. So yeah. one of the things we do is we try to have social mixers on a quarterly basis to get people, uh, give people an opportunity where they can actually really uh, talk to one another. So I think that's a great point, great comment, Patrick. Patrick, we're trying to find common interests among our members also to find new ways to get them together. So that might be something that works, we'll see. There, there are some fun things. One of our members took it upon herself to say, who's gonna enter the hamburger challenge? And she actually created a passport where once a month, she would invite people to her favorite hamburger restaurant and she would take nominations for other hamburger restaurants. And that was one of the best attended social things because it was this ongoing program of trying to find Portland's best hamburger. I've been to Tucson, you guys have awesome tacos. So why not do a rotational best taco of the month thing? I mean, you can have a lot of fun with the, the social aspect. Uh, well, I, when I think about Tucson tacos, I want to go back to your town. I have an even better idea. A couple of virtual meetings ago, I shared the double tree cookie recipe. That's where we meet is at the double tree. And so maybe we can have a, a double tree cookie cook off for our members. That might be. <laughs> <laughs> Love right, who can create, yeah. The next one up is uh, Margaret Higgins, and she is our membership chair. She's been membership chair for the last couple of years, done a great job. And by the way, she talks very nicely too. You're gonna have to unmute yourself, Margaret. You said you were going to. All right, here I am. Hey, Patrick, yeah, it was a great TED talk, thank you. And several things that you said, and also a word that Bob has just used, churn, made me think about PBS. I used to do some work uh, with PBS. And that took me to the research, which, which has shown that um, lower income people tend to donate more of their uh, their, their wealth, their worth, uh, than, 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 than higher people do, than higher income people do. So while Bob focuses on retaining people, membership chair, thankless task, I think, as you know, is trying to get people in. I'm wondering if we could or should consider restructuring and how could we do this so that we can bring people in who perhaps are uh, of a different uh, socioeconomic status to us, but who are known by research to give more of their time and their wealth. And maybe that'll help us to broaden our footprint as a, as a, as a rotary group. Yeah, that's a, you, you hit a very interesting issue, I think that all urban clubs struggle with because those stats that you mentioned at the beginning about engagement on lower income and, and social service yeah. work, it's, it's very true. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we've tried in our club that's been successful is some of our committees have opened themselves up to membership from people who are not in our club. Uh, we have a domestic violence prevention committee and they've actually brought in people from nonprofits uh, onto that committee to get engaged with some of the service work that that committee does. And what they've found is actually our current executive director started as a non-member of our club, engaged in that committee, then ultimately her organization decided to sponsor her membership when they saw you know, how useful the club was. Um, and actually she became our executive director a couple of years later. So that opened us up to somebody who probably wouldn't have joined. So maybe at the committee level, there were opportunities to uh, bring people in as volunteers as opposed to members. And perhaps there might be opportunities for their organizations then to sponsor them. Because although uh, they might not be able to afford it, uh, maybe they have uh, companies or nonprofits that could when they see the benefit. Um, so we're getting more creative in that sense. And I think Rotary as a whole is doing some really cool things with just creating different types of clubs. So in Portland, there are some new generations clubs that don't have high lunch fees. In fact, they don't have lunches. They just do happy hours. So they have lower, they have lower due schedules. So I think Rotary as an organization, Rotary International, is thinking differently. Um, and we're a lunch club like you are. Uh, and I think there's a space for non-lunch clubs because they have different uh, financial structures that allow for uh, lower cost membership. And I just want anyone to become a Rotarian. I, ideally, I want it to be a member of my club, but I just want them to join Rotary because I believe in what we do. Well, Patrick, that's wonderful. And I'd love it if you could send me, let's say, bullet points down of what you've just said and or what's actually happening there. Because yes, Bob, I think we can expand in that direction. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think that's fantastic. And, it, you, know, yeah. uh, you know, we have dues, of course, and a lot of our dues are, are, are to pay for the lunch fees. And, you know, we're trying to keep dues from going up. But at the same time, 
I don't want people thinking that's all we do is, 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 is eat lunch. I mean, Rotary is way beyond just having a lunch uh, and sitting together. So uh, anyway, next question, let's go to, uh, in my screen, right smack dab in the middle is Marsha Cornweedy. Go ahead. Hi, Patrick, thank you again for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, my question also has to do with recruiting. Some of it was covered in your answer to Margaret's questions, but could you please provide us some specific examples of ways your Rotary Club was successful in their recruiting efforts? The biggest thing that we have going for us now is our U40 program, our under 40 program for recruiting uh, younger members. We are now going into, gosh, it'll be year five coming up. Uh, and we actually copied what San Antonio Rotary is doing. And that is you bring in a cadre of people under 40, you create a, a cohort or a class coming in. And uh, for the past couple of years, it's been about 15 uh, folks under 40. Uh, and it's been huge. You look at our Rotary Club now and you see a lot of people without gray hair. And five years ago, that was not the case. Um, that is really our biggest source of membership. And these are younger people who are enthusiastic about service, they're engaged. For the most part, their organizations are sponsoring them, so we're getting some exposure to the corporate community. Um, I was skeptical if it would work, and fortunately, we had a young president who pushed for it. And what we found is people really like this notion of class, um, and they like some exclusivity. So there are events just for the U40 people. They did a sit down with the mayor of Portland, only for U40 members. They, out, they went out to the Nike campus, uh, only U40 members could do that. And some of us are jealous, of, of what some of the things they have, but it's actually been really cool because then the word gets out, our biggest recruiters for that program are U40 members. Wow. So you kind of have to believe in the process. Uh, we did not invent it. There are a handful of Rotary Clubs, I think, that are really doing it, but I think that's a huge opportunity. Uh, the other thing that has been great for our club is uh, women in leadership. So uh, our current president is a woman. Our incoming president is a woman. Going, past, going over the past 10 years, we have women at the tops of a lot of our committees. So I think when we have um, women come in as a guest, uh, checking out our club, and they compare us to other clubs that don't have women in prominent positions, it's been really good for us to attract them in because they see a path of growth within our club. So that's a big thing. Looks like Bob Schaff is leaving. <laughs> Bob, I don't know if you Thanks, know. Thanks, Patrick. I, sure. I, Thank you. I appreciate you showing me that note, but guess what, everybody else saw it too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, so going to the right, don't be afraid of the big bad wolf, okay? Mark Urban is our president-elect nominee. He's going to be after Jennifer Hoffman, and uh, I'll just throw it over to the big bad wolf. Thanks. You know, these are my virtual wolves. So they're supposed, oh, to be, boy. <laughs> supposed to be keeping the COVID around, uh, excuse me, away. So, hey, uh, uh, I just want to say first, thanks for taking the time. I love the TED Talk. Uh, just a quick digression, if I might. I had just done a virtual Zoom class with 75 students along with a friend of mine, Bill Shaw, uh, talking to college kids in the uh, master's program over at the University of Arizona. And our discussion was, okay, getting ready to graduate, you know, give me some tips relative to uh, interview skills. And one of the kids asked us what we thought was kind of our Thing that it maybe set us apart and gave us kind of an edge up and we talked about community service and how we just thought you know what a great way to mix and mingle with people that were just like you and so I walked out of that class and I get this freaking email from President Bob with your <laughs> mug on it tell me I should you know watch this video so when he sent around this video I had a chance to watch it for the third time and I loved it and I liked it so much that one of the talking points, uh, Patrick, that we had with the kids, I guess they're really not kids, uh, was just some things that I think they should think about and, and doing. And I just thought some of the things you touched on were just you know, completely reinforced everything that we were talking about and really kind of pointed out the elephant in the room and that is what's in it for me. But I guess my question and as typical, you've already answered two of them, it had to do with, you know, the younger folks, had to do with, you know, recruiting women and then also uh, minorities. And you touched really well. I love your idea on that U40, and I, I'd like to look at that seriously. You know, but I will think we've, that I'm aware that we've kind of done relative to recruitment of women is just to ask the women to kind of take that role over because we think they're better at that than any of us guys ever could be. And I'm not sure we've gotten any, any deeper into that, and I'm sure we probably should. But 
The other thing that we've all talked about is, uh, you know, minority. How do you, have you found something that has helped you relative to trying to balance out the demographics in your club at all? Yeah, uh, to, to short answer, we're struggling on that side too. Uh, just have not really cracked the nut there. Um, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, I think with, with youth and women we have, uh, Portland is not a very diverse city. We're actually one of the least diverse cities in America. And unfortunately, our club reflects that. So we want to do better. We're not. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you. I think we're all, you know, first of all, I, I love the, the U40 stuff. And, you know, I think you just got to create, we've seen some of that stuff with what we're doing. And, you know, I, again, I, I'm completely confident that the women know how to recruit women. And I, I, I'm pretty sure I get kicked a, a bit about it because we had a little rotary deal. And I, as Curtis knows, because he was behind me. Uh, I had a table of 10 and it was nine women and yours truly. So I, I'm kind of confident that I'm going to be successful and maybe convincing some amazing women to come and join us. But I really do struggle with the minority piece. And I, you know, I, I, I think we all do and we're all trying to kind of figure that out. So any insight that you have on that, I think is just, or anything that you might learn or anything, maybe that if we find anything, we'll share it with you as well. But uh, I just wanted to say, I, I, I think uh, your talk was great. I'm so glad I've had a chance to see it a couple of times. And more importantly, I'm glad I had a chance to share it with some younger folks that I think are going to get some big bang out of it. Everybody that sent me a, you know, a thank you note, I responded to them and said, you know, we talked about community service. Thanks for pointing that out in your uh, you know, note back to me. By the way, here's a YouTube link. I think you might get a kick out of it. And I've gotten uh, probably 30 or 40 notes back from these students uh, tell me how much they enjoyed it. So I, I'm glad I'm having a chance to visit with you and share that. So I'll shut up and let others talk. Thank you. Hey, Patrick, you, you got a couple more minutes, right? Yes, I sure do. I'm not in a rush. I'll tell you what, we've, I think we've got two more. Let's, uh, let's go to Doc Pratt. She, uh, she has one, and then we'll finish up with uh, Mary Ann. Sounds great. You have to unmute yourself. There we go. There I we had go. a stint many years ago as a membership chair too, so I can relate with everybody on how difficult it is. Um, but one of the things, and I really enjoyed your video, and one of the things that really struck me during it is that I'm sure that you're familiar with uh, management guru Simon Sinek. Mm, um, he wrote uh, the book, Start With Why. And the bottom line on that is that that people engage more because of why you do something as opposed to what it is that you do. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of his main themes throughout that book. And then his, another book that he wrote is called leaders eat last. And you touched on some of that too, and that hugs give you good um, endorphins and he goes through all of that and why people react the way they do. But what his books come down to and, and his guruship <laughs> comes down to as well as yours, it seems, is the notion of values. And I'm wondering how we can do a better job of projecting that because that's where the service comes in. And if you're doing service and you're feeling good about it, it's because what you're doing reflects your values. Mm -hmm. So how do we switch that from just join our club to we reflect your values and you can reflect our values? Yeah, I think that's an, some excellent points. And Simon Sinek is terrific. Um, I think in terms of values, as Rotarians, we have one of the best, I think the best value statement out there in the four-way test. Um, and I think we should not be relegating it to the past, as a lot of clubs have done. We put it out on our tables um, right now so people can look at it. And we have Rotarians who will, who will stand up and share their four-way test decision, how they ran their uh, decision-making through that, that prism of, you know, is it, is it true to the four-way test? So I know some clubs do four-way test speech contests, and that's great for the youth, but I think as adults, we should not be afraid to talk about values. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have something that I think is really unique to Rotary that uh, other service clubs don't have. Uh, so I, I, I think values are what make me want to do business with Rotarians um, and make me want to hang out with Rotarians. And I think to have that reaffirmed in our meetings is really important. I think to, to, to dovetail on that a little bit, when you come to our Rotary Club, like many Rotary Clubs, we have an inspiration, which now we're showing a video, and then we have a patriotic song. And I think for some that come to Rotary for the first time, the patriotic song is a little bit off-putting because you don't see that very often. But I think when you're around Rotary long enough, I think you realize the value of the patriotism of, of our club and our love for country. So 
I think there is a value proposition there. So let's finish up. Um, I'm never going to put a past president last in the line again. So Marianne, I'm so sorry, but we're, let's finish up with you. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Usually I'm not this wordy, but um, um, I do thank you for sharing your knowledge with us because we can all learn from each other. You have a club similar to ours, which is also good for us to compare. But I'd like to know how do we or do we want to change the thinking of the movers and shakers in our community who join Rotary just to get their name on the membership list and they think they're being a good member by just writing a check and not taking part in any of our activities or projects. Yeah, honorary members. So we, we have them as well. Um, you know, well, they're not they just honorary. <laughs> but the, so yes, and, and check writing members oh, who are, yes. yeah. So I, I think that um, we are trying to figure out ourselves how we can you know, leverage them. I don't know a single person who's joined our club because XYZ Big Fish was a member of our club. Um, what has been more interesting, I think, with those folks has been to um, try to engage them. They tend to be busy people, um, you know, heads of uh, large nonprofits or big folks in the city or what have you, uh, big business executives. So we'll ha ask if they'll do a business exchange so we can go to them and get their knowledge. And that definitely makes them feel more connected to the club. It's good from the standpoint of them feeling more engaged with us. It takes them beyond just being on an honorary role. So I think business exchanges are an opportunity. Uh, what we've done with some of them is brought them in for programs where as opposed to giving a speech, uh, we'll do like a onstage fireside where we'll have the club president interview them. And in many cases, they were active in Rotary at one point in time and they'll share their stories of activity, even though it's in the past. And that's actually been really good too. So I think it's just getting creative to figure out a way to kind of work on their terms to, to bring them more into the, into the lifeblood of the club. And those are two things that have worked for us. Do you feel that attracts more members to a club if somebody says, sees that so-and-so, whoever that might be is in the club, gee, if they are, maybe I want to be. Yeah. So, so, we, we've had people invite friends um, to those club meetings where we did those onstage fire, um, firesides, uh, and those have been effective. And we actually have gotten people to say, wow, this Rotary Club has some big time members. Um, so to the extent that they become real human beings and they're engaged with our membership and our prospective members, it's good. If they're just sort of sitting on the rolls and uh, we have it like that, it doesn't help much. What I'd like to do is bring them into our website where we have a video testimonial saying, hey, I was a Rotarian for many, many years. I still belong and here's why. So I think we can tap them, use them as tools. Um, and that's just jumping on the Zoom and getting their, getting their uh, testimonial for your club and then leveraging that on your website and on social media. That's a good idea. Thank you. I think we're pretty much out of time. I, I just want to say thank you again. Um, I don't know if Zoom is a new world order for Rotary uh, at every club uh, around the world, but uh, we, we have experienced it for the first time. I, I appreciate having the conversation. I felt like it was a conversation. And um, when, when you come to Tucson, you said you want tacos, we'll buy you some tacos. Excellent. I'm coming. Okay. <laughs> you won't keep me away with that promise. Thanks a lot, folks. We'll uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.